السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتبصروا بالحق وتبصروا بالصبر رب الشفاعي بصبري وأسر لي أمري وأسر لي أكثر من الإحسان يبقوا قبلي جزاك الله خير مولانا محمد for inviting me to the Leicester Salam Center the Peace Center ما شاء الله جزاك الله خير for inviting me again we did the last course on Islamic leadership here today we are here in New Year's Eve Although we don't believe that the, 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 the tomorrow is going to be the New Year's Day, but as Muslims, we're living in this environment, we need to uh, look at how best we can engage with the youth. And today, mashallah, there are uh, youth here, and um, Marana asked me to uh, do a session with them, thinking about how best we can look at our deen, uh, how we can come close to our deen, come close to Allah SWT. And the session is about how we can be positive in life. Uh, what is the purpose of our life? And I wanted to start with some of the words that I've put up on the board. And uh, we discussed a few of them, inshallah. So I'm going to carry on. So um, if I can ask you to choose a, another word, inshallah, and uh, tell us why you've chosen that word, and let's discuss it about, about it from the context of uh, our deen, inshallah. Shaitan. Shaitan, okay. So what, why, do you, why have you chosen that? I mean, uh, he causes you to do bad with waswas. Waswas, yeah, that's right. Okay, mashallah. So, shaitan, um, it always uh, creates havoc for us. But the shaitan is not powerful than the human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created human beings more powerful than the shaitan. We can easily overcome uh, the shaitan. When I say easy, depending on our nafs. So, sometimes we blame the shaitan, not all the time, but some, some of the times. But we shouldn't be blame, blaming the shaitan all the time because... In the month of Ramadan, the shaitan are tied. But we still blame the shaitan. And yet it's really the deaf nafs. And therefore, we have to look at shaitan um, using, uh, giving the waswasa in not carrying on, carrying out the, the good deeds, uh, not fulfilling the Allah SWT commandments, not praying five times a day, etc., etc. And when he's, success, when he's not successful in that, he'll look at little things. He'll, he'll look at little things that will... Uh, take us away from our deen and one of the big, biggest things that, uh, that uh, we need to be aware of particularly those who are married is that um, when the shaitan when the iblis is in his throne and the small shaitan comes to him every night and says um, I have uh, done this to not let this person pray or I have done this little thing that he is not allowed to do this the goodness in this etc etc but one of them says I have made uh, this person fight with his wife or divorce his wife and she had, the Iblis hugs this person and said you've done well you've done the best so watch out for those who are married you know Allah SWT has created us uh, like garments to each other garments that is so close to each other that uh, you know it touches our skin it gives us warmth it gives us gives a, covers our nakedness that's how we are to, to each other uh, as spouses and therefore we have to be very careful about how we react to, to our spouse and uh, how we deal with our spouse. So watch out for shaitan all the time, but don't blame shaitan all the time, where we know sometimes it's our nafs. Because three things that take away, away, away from me. One is the shaitan, but the second one is the wonders of the world. Social media, the extravagance, the constant entertainment, instant gratification. And the third one is the nafs. And that's what we need to look out for, the three levels of nafs. So be good. But don't lose heart, don't despair when you commit a sin because the shaitan has gone over you. Because Allah SWT has said, you come to me and ask for my forgiveness and repentance, you know, true repentance, Allah will forgive you. Even if the sins go as high as the sky, even then. So don't despair. So, um, can you choose the word? Uh, go with uh, peer pressure. Yeah, uh, I believe that in this uh, day and age, peer pressure has uh, become a very big issue in society, especially starting with uh, uh, going straight up with cigarettes and all that. Mostly, uh, youths are peer pressured by friends. That's so. true. Don't think that uh, things that that gives you pleasure and uh, things that are that everybody is doing is 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 right. Because right is right, even if the 99% of the population think it's wrong. Wrong is wrong, even if the 99% of the population think it's right. So don't succumb to peer pressure, because these pressures are 
very very powerful because if somebody smokes you just want to be in with the crowd and you want to smoke as well but then if you're a leader you will never succumb to it you know because everyone is a leader and if you for example if you hear the adhan and you want to do your prayers and all your friends don't want to do your prayers are you going to be succumbing to your to your peer, peer pressure but i tell you one day you want to go to pray and you ask them to come and pray as well and if you if they don't one day inshallah they will so you need to be a leader and not a follower you can only follow when you are among the righteous people who pray five times a day who are good in society then you can be a follower otherwise lead and don't succumb to peer pressure because there are so many so many ways that you could be pressurized by your, your peers and this is a huge problem at the moment because if you're among the righteous people the prophet sallallahu said and he used this parable if you go to a perfume shop you might not even apply the perfume but the fragrance will be rubbing off on you and similarly if you went to a, a blacksmith you might not use the equipment but the black smoke and black spruce is going to be going on going onto your clothing so choose your friends choose your friends wisely one uh, scholar mentioned if you really want to find out this particular youth how he's going to be in, in life uh, later on when he's 30 40 watch with who, he, who he hangs out with watch who he hangs out with who's his friends so choose your friends wisely and don't be pressurized just because your friends are so close to you and whatever they do is right be a leader when they're doing something wrong be a follower when they're doing something wrong right Akira. Akira. Yeah. Um, so why have you chosen Akira? Akira because it's a hope for uh, all the sinners and um, you know we all hope that uh, you know after this world of trials and tribulations that we will be given the uh, eternal felicity of Akira and uh, what hope is there for a sinner? Inshallah. For that, for that. Yes, Akira. We are here in this world for the Akira. In this dunya, it's just a test. We are going to be, um, we are going to be tested. We are going to be tested in this era of fitna, w the worst. This is the reason why the Prophet said that this Ummah will be the first one who will go to Jannah. We will be, we'll be tested most of all the things that have happened in during previous Prophets. They are all amalgamated in this era, and this is the reason why we are tested most. Look at the, look at the outside world. Look how there's so much fitna, there's so much temptation, there's so much test on our nafs. And therefore, if we are able to, to manage this appropriately and use the Quran and Sunnah to help us to go through these trials and tribulations, because we put, we put Akhirah on our mission statement, then inshallah we will be successful. Uh, and we are yearning towards going to Jannah. But remember, it's not easy, it's going to be tough. We'll be tested regularly. The shaitan is there. Our carnal desires are there. We will be regularly tested. But at the same time, mashallah, there's so many opportunities as well. Look, there are people who are embracing Islam in, in robes in all over the world. So what's, we need to look at that. And why is it that they're, one, they're the ones who are spearheading Islam in Europe? <coughs> those people who are embrace Islam. Because we've got so much cultural baggage. We are not looking akhirah as our mission statement. And that's the reason why. And we need to come back to our deen and start looking for that. Because we've got something so beautiful. The gift that Allah has given us is the Quran and this, this, this life of, of Islam, of our deen. But we need to move away from just Islam. Because Islam is practicing the five pillars of Islam, the, the articles of faith, sorry, the, the uh, aspects about worship, etc. We need to move into Iman, to be, to be a mu'min, to believe in, 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 in the belief system. And then to be a Muslim, to be at the Ihsan level. That is to be at the highest level where it is said that, you know, you don't see Allah, but Allah sees you. Or you, you are so close that you see Allah. And therefore, we need to aspire and, and uh, look for going to Jannah and put mission statement uh, as, the, as our Akhirah. Inshallah. Akhirah to us, mission statement. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Um, again, how we are motivated, how we should be self-motivated to be completely reliant on Allah <coughs> when our beloved Prophet said, when Allah wishes good for his slave, he hastened to bring about his punishment. Wow, just imagine, you know, you might think, oh, why is it always me? Why is Allah always punishing me? Well, Allah loves you. If you think it in that way, 
you will be in a positive thinking mind, isn't it? You'll always be in a positive state of mind. When Allah wishes good for his slave, he hastens to uh, he hastens to bring him about his punishment in this world. And if he does not wish good for him, look at this now. If he does not wish good for him, he will withhold his punishment until he's dealt with his sins on the day of judgment. Would you want that? I don't want that. I want to be punished here. I'd rather be punished here and get over it than on the day of judgment. When nobody's going to be there. And, you, and Allah is just telling you of the severity of the sin you've committed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will always um, judge you in the right way. But Allah is just, but Allah is also merciful. And that's why you have to look out, out for your fall, ibad, your, the rights of other people. Don't wrong people. Don't betray people. Keep your word. Keep your promises. Be trustworthy. Help people for the sake of Allah only. And that will be successful. And if somebody has wronged you, uh, according to this uh, important scholar, Hamdul uh, al-Qasr, one of the great uh, Muslim scholars in the ninth, uh, late 9th century, he has reported to have said, if a friend among you, of your friends err, i.e. makes mistakes, or commits a sin against you, make 70 excuses for him. Wow! Make 70 excuses for him. If your hearts are unable to do this, then know that the deficiency is in your own hearts. Wow! So therefore, we are required to forgive. Allah SWT has created us to forgive other people and find excuses for them. So give the benefit of the doubt of the other person who has wronged you. Now, what can you do? What kind of things that you can say? You could say, he must have had a bad day. It must have had been a misunderstanding between me and him. Uh, she didn't hear me, maybe. You know, she said something and you, you know, you're, not, you're not responding. Uh, he didn't see me. He tried his best. They didn't have time. He had no ch other choice. She didn't mean it. He he upset something. He must be upset about <coughs> something else. It was an accident. All these excuses are very much relevant. Now, if that person has been malicious anyway, and they have done something wrong, wrong to you anyway, if you have these excuses, you will be hurt in your heart. You won't have a grudge against them. So these excuses may or not may or may not be true, uh, but giving an excuse is a, another form of charity. It's a a type of charity and it's a path to forgiveness. Giving an excuse is a path to forgiveness. Then the first beneficiary of the person who forgives is themselves. So, you know, um, I, I say to, to all my young, young, young people, please, before you go to sleep, forgive others who have wronged you. It might not be true. Your perception might be wrong. Think it in that way. That way you'll be able to sleep better. Um, what about like people who take like um, uh, um, um, things like you know intoxicants to um, cover up their problems? I mean, is there a way that people can start to feel more contentment uh, without having to take intoxicants? Yeah, because people, um, you know, people get take take intoxicants or, or take uh, particularly alcohol because they feel that <coughs> that that, uh, that calmness for that short period of time. But then if they get addicted to it. If they get addicted to it, that is quite dangerous. And people do get addicted to it. But you can take out, you can come out from that addiction. Because of all the sins that you commit, if you have not committed sins against fellow human beings, you've only committed sins against Allah, Allah is so merciful, He may forgive you. So ask for Allah's repentance and Allah will forgive you. If you've drunk alcohol, but you haven't hurt anybody because of that, He's reaching you on Allah. If you haven't prayed, you know, you've missed your fajr, you missed your asr, you missed your zahar, only you and Allah knows, Allah will forgive you, ask for Allah's forgiveness. Because Allah is always waiting for your forgiveness. And the best time for asking for forgiveness is during Tahajjud, in the middle of the night, get up and cry to Allah subhanahu wa But do it sincerely. Do the apply the conditions of Tawbah that you're not going to be doing it again. But you know, we are human beings, we'll do it again. But, but the first Tawbah you made, it was from the heart. And you do it again, and you do it from the heart. Allah will be keeping on waiting you. Is waiting for you. Don't nag your wife. Don't nag your husband. Nag Allah. Allah expects you to nag him. You know, he comes down in the seventh heaven and says, Is there anyone of my slaves wanting to ask from me? So who are we? You know, Allah is asking us, why should we take that offer up? So our beloved Prophet said, overlook the slips of respected people. That means overlook the mistakes of other people. Because if you do that, Allah will cover your faults. On the day of judgment, and that's from Bukhari. 
And uh, you know, there are people who are less fortunate than you. If you, know, you really want to be in a positive state of mind, then consider yourself a blessing from Allah. Consider yourself that you are blessed from Allah. Because there are people who are who got no jackets that you have. They've got no coat that you've had. They don't have the food that we've just had. They don't know when the next food is going to come on their plate. You know, they are running towards food. We are running on a treadmill to, to discharge our food. To, to, uh, you know, to, to, you know, with the obesity that we have. It's a sad state of affairs. Mm -hmm. You know, according to the United Nations, every 2.6 seconds a child dies of starvation. So we have to be conscious of that. Are we not blessed by Allah SWT? We've got a roof over our head. We've got food. We've got a fridge full of food. You know, we, are, we, we have got everything. We've got cars. We've got houses. The people who've got nothing, the, the whole house is in the, on their backs. We've got nothing. So we are blessed by Allah SWT. So consider it as a blessing. Be grateful to what Allah SWT has given you. So whenever you see someone better than you in wealth, place or figure, you should look at someone who is inferior to you in these respects. And this is what the Prophet said, and that's from Bukhari and Muslim. You know? So a very important lesson that we can learn from Abu, Abu Qatada ibn Raybi al-Ansari, who used to say that a funeral passed by, and the Messenger of Allah said, he is now relieved, and people feel relieved of him. Wow. So a person has passed away, and our beloved Prophet said, he is now relieved and people feel relieved of him. So the people asked, Oh Prophet of Allah, how can, be, how can he be relieved and people feel relieved for him? He وسلم, said, The believing slave who dies is relieved for the, from the fatigue and, and, the, and, and, and the pain of this world. He is relieved from the calamity and difficulty and the pain of this world. And the rebellious slave dies before, 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 before people and the people, the trees, and the animals are relieved for him. You know what that means? Wow. It means that those people who are evil, they, they'll say, I'm really glad he's gone. They might not say it verbally. They might not put it in ordinary words, but in the heart they feel it. And they are relieved from him. It's from that evil person. Have you not seen that in life? If a dictator dies, the people think, oh my God, I'm so relieved that this person is gone. You know? Don't think that he will, he'll get away with it. He'll be judged on the day of judgment. But those people who are, who are good and righteous, they were relieved of this world and the pain and suffering they've had. So subhanAllah, good from this side and good from this side. But at the same time, those people who are evil and they die and they're relieved from evil, don't be one of those. When I'm saying evil people, you don't have to be so bad, but if you're doing bad things to other people, they will remember you. They will remember you of your action. They will remember you of this. And this is the whole thing about shouting and about being angry, etc. You know, they might get away, you might get away with it because you might think, okay, I'm angry, I'm so good. And this, because of, of the fear of this person, he's done everything that I wanted you to do. But you know, they'll curse you. They'll curse you. And did you know if this curse is, is appropriate to you because of your evilness, this curse will apply. If it doesn't, the person who's cursed you, it'll come back on them. Remember this. So try to do good. Try to prevent the doing evil to other people. Otherwise, they will curse you and it will impact on you. And uh, if you want to be confident in Allah SWT, look at this for this. Um, Sartre asked our beloved Prophet SAW, O oh, Messenger of Allah, which of the people suffers the most distress? Which of the people suffer most distress? He SAW, said, the prophets. Then those who come after them in terms of status. Then those who come after them. So the so the, the prophets, the saints, the, the sahabas and the saints, the pious people, the ulama, they will be suffering most distress. And they will be tested most. A man will be tested according to the strength of their iman. If his iman is strong, then the distress and the calamity that befalls upon them will be greater. They will be tested greatly. Um, and distress will keep befalling upon them until he walks on the face of the earth free from all sin. And this is what the point I'm making. If somebody is suffering in the hospital and he's a pious person, don't consider that, oh, he must be evil, that's why he's suffering so much. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to expiate his sins and he wants to purify his soul. He's a blessed person. So, you know, it's amazing that we, you know, that these hadiths are sometimes counterintuitive, 
But it's a huge lesson for us. And that's why we are required to be having trust in Allah all the time. Because in the Quran, chapter 65, verse 3, Allah says, And whosoever, whosoever puts his trust in Allah, then he, he will be sufficient. Mm -hmm. Yes, the boat. Uh, let me tell you a story about the boat. And this is a very good lesson for us. And I recently learned about this. I didn't know myself. I, I do a lot of reading. I research a lot. And uh, I don't profess to be an expert. I, I'm always learning. And that's why lifelong learning is a, it's a beautiful concept in Islam. And the reason why, in early years, Muslims thrived so well, the early Arabs, because the first word that was revealed was? Ikra. Ikra. Read. Seek knowledge. So in yesterday years, the scholars were not only scholars, but they were also specialists in their, in, in their specific fields. Like they were good physicians, or architects, or uh, you know, in science, in medicine. We excel so much. There's a book called 1001 Inventions, the Muslim heritage in the Islamic world. Alhamdulillah, it's this thick, written by Professor Salim Hassani from, from, from Manchester. And if you look at each and every page, so many things that we take it for granted was invented by the early Arabs because the first word that was revealed was Ikra, to read. We've lost that essence, unfortunately. Today we are so illiterate that we are, that around the world, we are learning to read Alid Bayte Se. We are learning to read. In yesterday years, we were reading to learn. The whole thing, the whole concept of mood. You know, it's the, it's the West that now, you know, um, reading to, to learn. And this is something that uh, the demise of the Muslims is because of that. Education, education, education is so important and so paramount. That's what's going to take us out. So in terms of the boat, the story behind this is this. A man was asked to paint the boat. Uh, he was a painter, basically. And he was asked to paint the boat for this rich man who had a family. And he had a very good boat, but uh, it, it needed uh, to be painted. And as this person was painting the boat, he saw a hole in the boat, the bottom of the boat. So he, did, he said to himself, let me repair this hole as well. And he did. And he completed the, uh, he completely completed the, uh, the, um, the painting of the boat. And then uh, he went away. The owner came and he saw the boat where he, with his three children in the, uh, in the, uh, in the sea. And he started crying. Why did he start crying? Because there was a hole in the boat. But then he saw the boat is not sinking. The boat is still coming. And the, uh, the boat came and he was so happy and content that my children are alive and they did not die because of the hole. And he was surprised what happened. So he asked the painter when he came to collect the money. He said to him, I, I covered the, the hole. And the rich man was so happy and content and he was giving him, you know, thousands of pounds, something like that. Because, you know, what, what he did, he said, no, uh, I, I didn't deserve that. I just wanted to pay the boat and I don't want the money. I just think this was something extra I could do. Look at the story behind this. Look at the moral of the story. So you're not asked to do something, but you did it for the goodness of yourself, for Allah's sake. And you've saved three people's lives because of the rich man was thinking they're going to dry, drown. So in life, always, always, there's only three things you're going to learn from all these sessions, by the way. Pick this one as one of them. Always, under promise and over supply. Under promise and over deliver. If somebody's asked you to do something, do something extra, do something bonus for Allah's sake. If somebody's asked you to, to repair this door, repair it, but if there's something else that's, that, that there's, there's afforded it, do it for Allah's sake. Because Allah will reward you. This guy will be pleased anyway. He won't, he's not going to be this happy. He's, he's thinking, wow, I didn't even pay him for this. But don't ask for the money. Because that's, for, that's from Allah. And I tell you, your risk will increase. Your, your blessings will increase. Honestly, my brother, honestly. It will increase so much, you'll be uh, amazed where this coming, the money coming from. Where is the risk coming from? So remember, under promise, over deliver in life. Allah. Yeah? Does that make sense? That's yeah. the story of the word. Okay, next one. Who wants to choose this word? Uh, and tell us why you've chosen the word. World. Uh, Sorry? World. Which one? World. Oh, world. Okay. Yeah, so, um, world. So you've probably heard the phrase, uh, uh, money makes the world go round. 
and uh, I believe uh, it's, it's an example like uh, money doesn't buy happiness, but it only buys opportunity. Yeah, good. So money, there's nothing wrong in earning buckets full of money. Ask Malana, I used to earn buckets full of money. Still do actually. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong in that. There's nothing wrong in that. It's how you've earned it and how you've spent it. The more rich you Muslims, the more zakat you'll pay. You know, subhanAllah, in this country we give 100 million pounds in, in charity. According to the Charities Commission, they have deduced that Muslims are the, the, the only religious community that pays more in charity than any other religious community in this country. But it will be in the world as well, I'm, I presume. So therefore, the more money you get, the more money you earn, have this understanding in your heart that you're going to do good for society. Because Allah will bless you even more. Because man is greedy. The Prophet said, if a man has a mountain of gold, he'll have another, he will want another one. <laughs> he'll want another one. But if you are grateful to Allah and you utilize this money in the right way, there's nothing wrong in that. So this world, by the way, don't shun it. Because our beloved Prophet said, you don't have to be in the masjid all day long. <coughs> I'm praying because because your 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 wife has a right over you, your body has a right over you, so therefore fast and do not fast, pray and do not pray, pray all you know not all night, sleep or need to sleep. It's in Surah Muzammil as well. So therefore, do the the thing that you need to do. But you know, did you know this? Subhanallah, this is so powerful. This is what inspires me so much. Um, a person who does the minimum. And this is from the hadith, by the way. There's a minimum. Pray, pray five times a day. He goes to Hajj just once. He fasts only in the month of Ramadan. But he is very good with his neighbor. He's very good with people. He's got good manners, good etiquettes. He helps people out. That person, and the one who prays all day, but does so many supplementary prayers, gets up at the Hajjud, and also prays not on, fast only not only in the month of Ramadan, but Mondays and Thursdays as well. And not only gone for Hajj once, but so many Umrahs and many Hajj as well. That person and this person, did you know, subhanAllah, is equal. Good manners and etiquettes is, is, is the way to Jannah. You have to do the minimum as well, the, 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 the worship. Otherwise, you will not enter paradise. But, but then you've been a, a good person in life. And therefore, re remember yourself in terms of not to be arrogant. Because arrogance, if you've got a, a, an iota worth of arrogance in you, you will not enter paradise. So watch out. The world and the money, yes, the world is there to be tested, but enjoy the world as well. Enjoy it. I mean, I play table tennis, I play badminton, I go swimming, I, do go, I go to the gym, you know. Um, I take my foster kids out on different activities. We go out for huge walks, but then when we go there, we see the awe of Allah SWT, you know, the, the green grass, the trees. So enjoy yourself. Yes. Don't overeat. Eat good food. Eat wholesome food. Nothing wrong with that. Play games, yes, but there's a limit to it. You know, don't be there's a law of diminishing returns in everything. So do it, things in moderation. And that's the motto in the middle path. Uh, next uh, next one? Next the word? Uh, the continuous point. professional development. <coughs> and why have you chosen that? Um, because if you don't develop your own, whether it is professionally or just in general or even um, to do with Islam, if you just stay on the same thing, you're not going to grow as a person and other Absolutely. people around you, you won't be able to help them and then teach them more about it as well. Absolutely. Every, every authority, everybody, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a management consultant, there's always CPD, Continuous Professional Development. Why shouldn't we have a person con continuous professional development ourselves? We need that. We need to be reminded all the time. Lifelong learning is an Islamic concept. You know, and learning is something that's so important that the words of wisdom is this, that even if you have to go as far as China, go and seek to learn. I have come all the way from Dewsbury, you know, 200, 150, 100 miles or so. Why? Because I want to learn. I want to, uh, to be inspired. And therefore, if you do that for, the, for Allah's sake, then Allah SWT will reward you. Learning, it is said that even the, the, the birds and the uh, birds and the animals will pray for you. Am I right, Manana? Is there a hadith about this? There's a very powerful hadith about seeking knowledge. What, what is it, Manana? Can you just remind me, please? I've got it in my, in my slides, but it's a very, very powerful hadith that should inspire you about learning. 
Yeah. When you go in the path of um, Allah yeah. to learn, then even in the bird, even the birds and, 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 and the fish in the sea will also pray for you. When Salaka Tariqa, the person who goes on to the path seeking knowledge, Sahalallahu Lahu, to be Tariq in the Jannah, that one is the one that Allah's Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that Allah Ta'ala makes a path to Jannah easy for you. Look at that. That in itself should be inspiring you. So it's never in vain. Man yurid illahu bihi khayrai yufakhir bihi. Whoever Allah Ta'ala wishes good for, Allah Ta'ala grants him understanding about these. It's so powerful. It's so powerful. So it means don't don't despair this world. <coughs> Enjoy this li life of this world as well. But be on the straight path. Be in the straight path. Don't be like a monk being in the masjid all the time. And this is what we have to do. This is what we're going to take, take it to Jannah. Be out there because the because the Prophet is he married, so so therefore we are tested with marriage. He did dawah. He was outside. He was with his family. You know. So therefore we are required to to do all these things because we otherwise there's no test. If we're going to be staying in the masjid all the time and we think this is what's going to be taking us to Jannah, then where's the test? The test is going out there in the field to be doing good. And tested whenever evil or if some, some calamity befalls upon us, and when we ha when we truly rely on Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, that's the real test. I hope that makes sense. Yes, yeah, sins to the sky. Um, okay. Because we um, are human being, and um, the insan uh, translated in Arabic, of course, this word is the one who forgets. Um, because Adam al Islam, peace be upon him, he slipped in the Garden of Eden and disobeyed God in in the going to the tree and getting from the tree and then we were put on this earth as a test how can our sins be uh, you know uh, erased and how, how can we you know handle our sins in a way that is better for us it's a very good question mashallah and also it's a very powerful one a very uh, deep one but it is so simple first of all do, do you think Allah did not know that Adam was going to go to this forbidden tree of course, Allah SWT knew, and that they will be putting, will be putting uh, onto this earth. But when he truly repented, Allah forgave him. So who are we? A prophet had been forgiven, and we commit sins all the time. Don't think we will be forgiven? Of course we will be. So therefore, you, the, the parable our beloved Prophet uses is this. You can commit sins as wide as this ocean. Or as high as the sky. Now, who would commit sins from this earth up to the clouds? Who? Because look, the sky is up to like it's like infinity. It keeps on going and expanding. Even from Hazrat Adam till today, 2020, tomorrow, if all the sins were put together of human beings, wow, it will still not reach the sky. Look at the mercy of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So nobody will commit that many sins. But this is the parable Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uses in the Quran. And you commit these sins, Allah will forgive your sins if you truly repent. So whatever sins you have committed, you have to have, and there are conditions of Tawbah as well, that you will not do it again, that you will, you know, that you repent, that you, your, your consciousness is there, you have a guilty conscience as well, you're truly asking for Allah's forgiveness. But then you still commit your sin, that same sin. Allah will do it again. Again, you come back to true Tawbah, it has to be true, not because Allah knows if, if, you're, if you're playing games. But then there's two sins that Allah SWT will not forgive. This is something we have to be very careful about. What are they? What are the two sins? You know, when we saying, when a lot of people say, I've come from come back from Hajj, and I've heard that the Prophet said, you know, you, you like as if you're, you, you're a newly born baby, all the sins are wiped out and you're clean. That's true. But the two sins, that are not forgiven, that we need to be reminded of, which the Prophet mentioned, is what? Shirk. Shirk, yeah. If you indicate a God with a partner, that God has a son or God has a partner, and sometimes shirk is such that we actually believe in something that is always, you know, better than Allah sometimes, you know, so sad. That's that one. Because if that's the case, then you're out of the fold of Islam anyway. What's the second one? What's the second sin? Anybody know? All encompassing. Yes, Mother? Pride. Sorry? Pride. 
Pride is one of them. Arrogance, because if you if you have an iota worth of arrogance that you belittle to other people, then you will not end up either. But what's all encompassing? The rights of other people. Because one of the companions um, asked a question to the Prophet when he said, um, don't become bankrupt. Don't become bankrupt. So one of the companions said, Oh Prophet of Allah, is that about financial transactions? No. A bankrupt person is he who on the day of judgment will come with mountains of good deeds, so many mountains of all these good deeds that they've done, but they've cheated this person, they've lied to this person, they didn't keep their word to this person, they physically harmed this person. On the day of judgment, these people will come to you and say, I want these rewards that you have. And just imagine, if you've committed sins to all these people in your 60, 70, 80 years of your life, a thousand people, there's a queue of a thousand people. Depending on the severity of the sin that you have committed, they'll be wanting that. It will be truly a transactional relationship there. And Allah is just. And if all your deeds, mountains of deeds, has, has wiped out, then the Prophet said, your, their sins will be coming onto you. What kind of a state of, of a status of affairs that you'll be in on that, on that day of judgment, just imagine. So therefore, first of all, prevent committing a sin against a fellow human being. And secondly, um, repent and ask for their forgiveness if you've made a mistake, before they die and before you die. It's so easy. So first of all, prevent making a sin against you know, a fellow human being. And if you have made a mistake or you've erred or you've committed a sin against them, ask for their forgiveness. So therefore, backbiting, they will never know that you've backbited unless they know from somehow. Because that is something where our beloved Prophet said, Do you want to eat the flesh of, the, of your dead brother? When our Prophet went into the uh, heavens with Jibreel, uh, uh, the uh, Miraj, um, he saw some of these people uh, eating the flesh. He said, Who are these people? And these are the people who are backbiting. And backbiting is something where something has, somebody has done something wrong and it's true and you, you're backbiting against them, but something that is not true, and you're truly character assassination, you, you, you're really assassinating their character, where it's not true, and that's considered to be slander, that's even worse. So avoid that. So therefore, sins, be careful what sins you commit. Sins you committed against Allah, you've not prayed. You have not fasted. You've never been to Hajj. And you pass away. But you've been a good person, you've been a righteous person. Maybe. Don't bank on it. Allah is merciful, He may forgive you. Don't bank on it, you have to pray, you have to go, go for Hajj, you have to fast in the month of Ramadan, you have to pay your zakat. Unless your mental faculties are not functioning, by the way. Because those people who have mental illness or mental health problems, they are known as the people of the innocence. Our beloved Prophet said, they are known as the people of the innocence. Today, in this country, we used to call these people mad, stupid, spastic, so many derogatory terms. But in our deen, we, we call them people of the innocence. They are not accountable for on the day of judgment. They are in the paradise without accountability. So who's better, we or them? Who's more superior, they or us? Just imagine. So in life, look at people, even if they are negative towards you, look at it, look at them, look at it positively. You know, um, um, Repel evil with goodness. Repel evil with goodness. Another counterintuitive from our deen. Ask a non-believer, what do you mean? You know, you have to take revenge. No, we are forgiving. Because our beloved Prophet was forgiven. He even made friends uh, from enemies. He forgave people in the situation of Taif and many others. He changed a negative into a, a positive. He took a positive out of every negative. Which we need to learn ourselves in our lives, inshallah. Good. Anybody else? Want, um, whose turn is it? Yeah, Captain. <coughs> purpose. Purpose. What's the purpose of life? So, Kashi, why have you chosen that? Um, because, you know, uh, as we live in a day and age of materialism, and many people have uh, absconded and become atheists, 
and uh, they believe the purpose of life is to the sensual pleasures in life. Uh, if it's good, if he feels good, it's all good. And um, what what can you see is the problem of um, having a, a life of uh, um, hedonism and um, of satisfying yourself, and what pro problems can it cause? And additionally, um, what is the real purpose of life, and why is it so? Mm. Okay, so the purpose of life is basically to worship Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Worshiping Allah does not mean just going to pray five times a day. Worshiping Allah is going to get a good job, earning a halal means of living, being good to your spouse, um, being good to your children, uh, your grandparents, your neighbors. All this is purpose of life. This is uh, considered to be nibada. If you are a good neighbor, in fact the hadith is this, that if your neighbor goes hungry and you've got enough food in the house, you are duty bound to share your food. Otherwise you're committing a sin. And the purpose of life is to, to be good in society uh, and to worship Allah in, in, in all these ways. Um, but at the same time, if you, want to, if you want to have happiness, can I tell you, I've got some bad news for you. This world is not for happiness. It's for contentment. The word that we use as Muslims is contentment. Are we content with what Allah Subhanahu has given us? If we are content with what Allah Subhanahu has given us, then we are, we are reaping the benefits and the, and the blessings that Allah Subhanahu has given us. If we want to be good, if we want to aspire to be, to be, to, 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 to be the best, look at those people who are below you, not those who are above you. This is what the Prophet Sallallahu said. If we think that um, you know, we want to aspire to somebody who's got a Mercedes and a BMW, don't look at that. Because if you've got a Toyota, look at somebody who's got a bike. If you've got a bike, look at somebody who's got no bike, and who's only got shoes. If the person who's got the shoes, look at the person who has got only slippers. If the person who's got slippers, look at the person who's got no slippers, who are, who are barefoot. And there are enough people in this world who are so poverty stricken that they, they, are, they are roaming around their places with their homes in their backs. So we are so blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have a roof over our head, we have a fridge, we have a car, we have clothing, we have food on our plate three times a day, sometimes five times a day. There are people who are yearning for, for the next food coming on their plate. So who are, who are better? We or them? Who are more blessed? We are. If we are more blessed, we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the purpose of life. Uh, countries you live in, uh, the reason why I say that is because uh, people sorry, think which that one, sorry, which countries you live in, uh, the reason why I, s I said that is because uh, some people think that uh, it depends on where they live, it, 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 you know, it differentiates, it, sorry, it, um, it affects their deen or well-being. Uh, like for example, you, you'll have different schools, if there's education in that school, uh, it depends on that, it, it depends on that individual to either learn or not. That's true, Mashallah. The country that you live in, first of all, never consider that wherever you live is good or bad. You are living wherever you are, and that's a blessing from Allah SWT. We are living in this country, and it's a na'mah that we are living in this country. Here there's an opportunity for us to do da'wah. But look at the opportunities here compared to other countries. And for those people who are from, from different parts of the world, for example, India, Pakistan, or Bangladesh, or even in the Middle East, where are we better off? Are we better off in this, in this country or are we better off in our own respective country? Is there more justice in this country or is there more justice out there? You tell me. Where? Here. Yeah, in this country. <coughs> if I ask you this question, this is, a, this is the acid test. If I ask you this question, that uh, Allah forbid that you had committed a crime, but then you had a choice where you would be judged, either in Leicester Magistrates Court or in Lahore, or Islamabad, or in Timbuktu, or in Bombay, or in Dhaka, where would you choose? Or in Saudi Arabia, or in Dubai, or the UAE, where would you choose? Would you choose less the magistrates court, or those respective countries I just mentioned? Depends or the Muslim country. countries? Depends on the crime. Depends on the crime, okay. Give me, a, give me an example. Well, if you're thinking from a Muslim, perspective you'd rather get ruled out by uh, by Saudi Arabia because they follow by the Sharia law and that means you'd uh, carry out your punishment in this world uh, not the hereafter. Can you, can you just close it? Yeah sure. Uh, one second. The whole earth is a place of worship so there's no such thing as borders as far as the is concerned. 
we don't have to have an Islamic state to follow our deen. Islamic state from, comes from the heart. So in the, wherever you are living in, wherever you are living in, you know, make the most of it. Don't think I should be living in that country. The grass is not green on the other side of the hill. Definitely not. In this country, we have so many opportunities to practice our faith. Mm. There are prayer facilities in the prisons, mm. at the airport, mm. uh, in the hospitals, mm. in universities, mm. isn't there? Mm. And nobody's going to bother you. Like in some countries, there is, there is this, this aspect around where people are not able to pray, for example. So this is so important that we need to look at it in that context. Does that make sense for that? Alhamdulillah. Okay, uh, anybody else? Want, we have to take a break sometime, uh, Tashif. Yeah. Um, you want to take a break um, so after the next one or this okay, one? I'll, I'll one more and then we'll, 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 we'll take a break. How are you? Good to see you. It's up to you. Okay, who wants to choose the word? I will open up. Uh, an enemy. Enemy. Okay. Um, enemy is a person can be an enemy of himself um, by uh, following uh, Satan, the accursed. Now, how, what are the best ways to protect oneself from uh, such an enemy? Okay. First of all, uh, always think think that Shaitan is your enemy. Nobody else. Yeah. If somebody's done bad thing to you, they might not be the enemy for you. It might be your perception. And so look, everything, every time you look at something good and bad to you, you repel evil with goodness. Because sometimes it's just your perception. And this is something so, so powerful. Like, let me give you an example. One of the earlier um, scholars uh, in the 9th century, I can't remember his name now, he said when somebody's wronged you, find 70 excuses for them. I.e. give them be the benefit of the doubt. So. 70 doesn't mean literally 70, it's an Arab word, it's an Arabic saying to, see, to say many, find many excuses. So if somebody has wronged you, try and find something like any excuse, um, maybe he did, he did this by mistake, or he didn't mean to do this, or I think he's got a problem with his parents and I know that he's, he's, he's so engrossed in that. So if you do that, the heart it will be pure, because you haven't got a grudge against that person and you don't see them as an enemy. Because a very powerful story behind this is this. A man was coming towards the Prophet and he had his companions with him as well. And uh, he came uh, with the, all his water was coming down his face, he did a voodoo, and all his hair and beard was disheveled. And SubhanAllah, you know, our beloved Prophet said, this is a man of Jannah. And this person had a slippers in his, under his sh 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 shoulder as well. The second day, same thing happened again. This is the man of Jannah. Third day, same thing happened. So one of the companions said, gosh, what has this guy done that he deserves Jannah? So he went to his house and said, I'd like to stay with you for, for a couple of days. And he stayed there for three days. And he gave a white lie, said, I've got a problem with my dad about property matters. I said, yes, you're welcome. And he watched him during the day and night, whether he was doing something different to the other companions that he deserved Jannah. And he observed and observed and there was nothing that he was doing differently. Everything that he was doing was exactly the same that every, uh, every other Sahaba was doing. So he was thinking and scratching his head, what could it be? And then he, he just gave up and he started go, going away. And, and the, the companion, the, the house owner, uh, said to him, the, the guy who, who, has, has, uh, um, who was tested for Jannah, asked him, was there any specific reason that you stayed for three days? And uh, uh, he said, yes. Um, Prophet Salaam said that you deserve Jannah, and I wanted to find out what you did differently. And he said, there isn't anything I could do. And as he was walking out, he said, ah, there might be one thing. He said, I don't keep a grudge against anyone. SubhanAllah. I don't keep a grudge against anyone. I don't see anybody as an enemy. Wow. So in life, Pita, Make sure that you give the benefit of the doubt to the other person. You'll feel good in your heart. Don't have a grudge. Have you seen people walking like their shoulders like this? Because they've got grudges against people. You know, if 100 people have wronged them, they've got a good memory. They remember their names, their first names as well, and they said they've wronged me this with this. But it might be a wrong perception that they might have. Even if it's true, forgive them. Because the first beneficiary of the one who forgives others is themselves. So every night, before you go to sleep, Peter, I tell you, say to yourself, this person, this Rafiq or Yunus or, or Rahman or Yasmin or Rihanna has wronged me. 
Oh Allah, for your sake I'm going to forgive them. You know you sleep better. You will not need sleeping tablets. You will sleep better because you don't have a grudge in your heart. And Allah will bless you for that. Honestly, it's so powerful. So don't have enemies. Try to do, try to prevent commit, committing sins against fellow human beings for Kukul Ibad and try not to have grudges against people and don't have arrogance because arrogance will take you into hellfire because the Prophet said even if you have a mustard seed of arrogance in you i.e. you will belittle other people because you got a PhD degree or you're so intelligent or you're so pious or, or you, you know you pray five times a day with so many hugs you're belittling other people you will not enter paradise look at people uh, as goodness if there's them something wrong they find excuses for them they might have a mental health problem they might have a mental illness problem. Do you think that Allah Subhanahu has blessed you good? If you see somebody, somebody, something doing something wrong, change it with your hand. And if you think that you cannot do it like that, change it with your words or in writing. If you can't even do that, at least in your heart, thinking this is something wrong. And that's the weakest form of iman. But at least you've heard some. You know, you have, you have felt it in your heart. So that's why it's so important that you don't look, don't look at enemies as enemies because our beloved Prophet Sallallahu he changed enemies into, in, in, into friends. That's what we need to do as well, inshallah. Okay. That discriminate uh, their own religion in the masjid. For example, like I said, you know, when we had a, this introduction, I said that I saw a video where they were, in a way, mocking Islam by saying that if a, a, fellow, a f fellow Muslim leaves Islam, uh, he should be killed. How do we sort of come by? You know, yeah. It's a good question. You know, in Islam, there's no compulsion on religion. Yeah. Truth stands out clear from error. You know, there are people who are becoming murtad in this country. Mm -hmm. We are living in, in, in a non-Islamic state. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no country in the world that is considered to be an Islamic state. The Islamic state that we hear in the news in terms of ISIS is not Islamic and it's not even a state. And the majority of Muslim countries, they use pockets of Sharia, but not in its total compliance, not in its totality. So we can't say, let's go to this Sharia compliant country, because there isn't any in, in, in the world. Um, I think the nearest one perhaps is Malaysia. But I think in this country, Sharia comes from the heart, the way that you apply your, your Sharia. So those people who have left Islam, it's no skin of your nose. You look at yourself. Never mind them. You know, when you're pointing a finger at someone, there's one thing that pointing at them, but three things are pointing at you. If they've become murtad, if they've less, left their deen, then perhaps consider you, you doing something about it. You know, why are they leaving the deen? What can I do about it? How can I uh, improve myself to, uh, to show my acts and mannerisms and etiquettes? People are leaving Islam because of the actions of the Muslims. Did you know that? They're not good looking at the source, the Quran and the Hadith, and they are in misinterpreting it. Yet there are people who are coming to the fold of Islam in large droves, aren't they? Because they've gone to the source, the Quran and the Hadith. 5,000 people embrace Islam in this country every year. So therefore, we need to look at what we can do in society for the betterment of our society. You know, there are times that I have seen that there are people who are practicing Islam who are non-Muslims. You know, there's a very famous person who said that I, have, I went to the Muslim land, but I didn't see Islam. I went to the non-Muslim land in the West, I saw Islam, but I didn't see Muslims. So just imagine, this is the status of, status of affairs of the Muslims. We need to be united. We need to have clear leadership. <coughs> we need to follow our deen. We need to have leadership in, at micro level. Pray the Quran, zikr, um, you know, learn the Quran, what Allah says, reflect and, and ponder on the words of the, of the Quran, what Allah is saying to us. It's a letter to every one of us. And be good in society. That way, you know, perhaps, inshallah, through your efforts, people might not leave Islam. Mm -hmm. And make efforts as best as you can. Because there aren't any facilities for the youth who can be sort of guided back to the deen, unfortunately, uh, I'm sad to, it's sad to say. Masjids are sometimes just, just uh, um, accompanied by elderly people. We don't see many youth uh, in the masjid. Yet there are many more and more people are praying nowadays. You know, Alhamdulillah, after 9-11, more people have come back to their deen. You know, women are wearing scarf, a lot of people embrace Islam. So whenever there is a terrorist attack, there's a, <coughs> there's a surge of, of, of need to learn more about Islam. On the other hand, there are many who are leaving as well. And, and therefore, we need to make dua for, for these people. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, sorry, uh, going off topic, uh, the topic is uh, Sharia law. Uh, is, I've read somewhere that Sharia law says that if you live in a society or a country uh, other than, let's say, Saudi Arabia or, or Dubai, or that is 
uh, what we what what they say is Islamic state, but uh, generally speaking, they're not so as so Islamic. Uh, is it true that Sharia laws uh, uh, instruct us to follow the the laws of that country? Um, yes. To out of respect. And, yes, uh, absolutely. Like we have to follow in Islam. We are required to follow the law of the land, unless it contradicts to Islam. So, if, for example, the government of the day says you cannot pray five times a day mm -hmm. because the law says you can't, like they do in, in China, then you leave the country. But I tell you, I myself, I'm saying from the bottom of my heart that this country allows us to pray. There is no hindrance from the state or the people. People in society are more helpful to you. You know, if the youth have not travelled abroad. You need to travel to find out what the world is about. The world is not good. You know, there are many, many countries that have so many problems about even Muslims, countries that faith in Muslim countries. You know, in Tunisia until recently, until the Arab Spring happened, you know, women cannot wear their hijab. You know, so therefore, we need to look at our own countries ourselves and also look at those countries where we are able to practice our state, our, our faith freely, alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah. Because the whole earth is a place of worship. As Prophet said, make the most of wherever you are. But have this intention that whenever you move to another land, like we have done, because our parents came to this country, have this intention now to do dawah. Because your intention is uh, whatever you intend to do is what Allah will reward you for. If your intention is to get married, the Hadith says, then your intention is to get married. If your intention is to you know, propagate Islam in this new land of yours where you've migrated, that's your intention. So make that intention, make every effort to do da'wah. Da'wah does not mean just giving books to the non-Muslims or inviting them to the masjid, but da'wah is about giving them food when they need it, helping them to the, to the best of your ability, have your correct mannerisms, etiquettes, which they've got and we haven't, unfortunately. We've got our Islam, but we haven't got our deen that we, apply, uh, that we should be applying, which they are applying many of the time. And they haven't got the iman, but they've got the etiquettes and mannerisms, they've got everything else. If that makes sense. Um, also, in terms of, um, you know, when our beloved Prophet said, so, so, so. look at the person who is below you and not above you. None of you truly will believe also uh, for what he wants for himself, for his, uh, for his brother. None of you truly will believe until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. And that's from Bukhari. So, if you think that, uh, you know, uh, let me give you an example. Um, one of the brothers make me some, some tea just now. And just imagine, if they... If they were making me a cup of tea, and they were making themselves a cup of tea as well, but they accidentally, accidentally dropped the, cup, uh, the tea bag on the floor, and they pick it up, and they notice that uh, this, this tea bag is still, not, is still okay, it's not that bad, it, it's, still, uh, it's just rubber for anything that they have, and they make the two cups of tea. Would that person give me the cup of tea, that's the, 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 the tea bag that was dropped, or will will uh, uh, will uh, drink it themselves and, uh, and give me the, the, the one that didn't drop. And that's the question, isn't it? So that's the, this, this is the test. So Allah knows what, what you've done. So therefore, give the benefit of the doubt, and if you think it's, it, this is something really bad, throw it away. But then give that clean to, to, to the person. I mean, one person embraced Islam just because he saw an honest trader. You know, the, the reason why Muslims um, in Malaysia and in Indonesia embrace Islam is because of the truthfulness of the traders that came to those lands from the Middle Eastern countries who are Muslims. Because they, they, they wished um, good for them just as they wished good for themselves. Yeah. And be truthful and honest, uh, and honest traders. It reminds me of a story <coughs> of a, a king once who was approached by two women who were saying that they both uh, were the mother of this child. So they thought how we're going to work this out whose child this is because it was before technology and dna tests so the king says okay he was a wise king so he says draw a circle on the ground and they drew a circle with a chalk on the ground and uh, they said to the child stand in the middle of the circle and then they spoke told the two women who were contesting the child's mothership they said okay you grab one arm each and then they grabbed one arm each and then they said pull so both mothers started pulling the child and uh, one of them let go. They saw basically the king said to them, uh, um, uh, to the one, this, she, in the beginning she, he said to him, look, whoever pulls the kid out of the circle, that's the mother. Yeah. Whoever pulls the kid out of the circle, that's the mother. So when they both started pulling, one pulling one way, the other pulling the other way, 
one let go, the one. And uh, what happened was he was just testing them because the real mother, because she saw the child was in pain, let go of the child. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. And um, the the question which was to pull them out of the circle was actually the um, counter of the reality was that mm. he was testing who was going to have mercy on the child first and then he gave he gave ownership of the child to the one who let go first yeah, so yeah the mother has you know just imagine Allah SWT is more merciful than the mother of a child you know talking about mercifulness and about consideration uh, our beloved Prophet SAW was leading a prayer and he saw a baby crying and he hissed the prayer so the baby can get to the mother quickly just imagine the emotional intelligence of our beloved Prophet And, and he, he, he reminded us, and this is from Tirmidhi, do not rejoice in the misfortunes of your brother, for Allah may show him compassion, but create difficulties for you. He may create difficulties for you. You know, there are people who, who, who find happiness and contentment, and uh, you know, uh, so happy of somebody suffering something. So Allah will be merciful to that person, and may, 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 may harm, you may be harmed, uh, you know, because of this, uh, in this world. And, and this is the reason why we need to look at having good morals. You know, the teaching of, of our beloved Prophet is this, uh, three things that are part of a good morals of a, of a believer. When he is overcome by anger, his anger should not drive him to falsehood. And really, we need to look at how we manage our anger. There are so many Muslims who are very, very angry. And there's so many strategies that our beloved Prophet has asked us to deploy to manage our anger. So whenever he is overcome by anger, his anger should not drive him to falsehood. When he is happy, his happiness should not take him beyond the bounds of what is what, what is right. Of everything that is of concern of him, whether it is to do with his dislike or in the hereafter. <coughs> so the people like him suffering in Syria at the moment. And the people who are Muslims in the West who are having to, you know, having all the luxuries in the world. So you are saying that basically the people that are suffering in Syria, maybe in the on the day of judgment, these people will have been forgiven because they suffered in this life. And the people who are having all the luxuries in the West will have to be stuck in a, a, a giving account of all the things that they did. So you are basically saying that, you know, you know, we, we, the people who are in luxury in this world should be worried about the 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 account day of account and the people who are suffering they should be uh, happy and content in the f that that they they are uh, suffering right now but on the day of judgment their light uh, their burden will be made easy. So people who are who are suffering, they take action as best as they can to be in a good position. It doesn't mean that you are okay. You be passive. Oh, these bombs are coming on me. Okay, you know Allah will will forgive me, etc. etc. You do whatever you can. If, if it falls upon you, change it with your hand. If you can't, with your words or in writing. If you can't even do that, at least in your heart, consider this is something wrong. So when Arab Spring happened, you know, when our beloved Prophet said, the, the best jihad is a, saying a word of truth in the court of a tyrant ruler. So therefore, the people who are bearing this calamity and difficulty, yes, they are forgiven because they are tested so much and they are suffering. But they are patient as well. But they still have the Iman. That's a test. If they lose their Iman, and some people have become murtad, I'm not talking about Syria, but somewhere else, then they have lost their Iman. But the pe people of Syria, mashallah, they're so patient. You know, we can see that. The people of Palestine are so patient. But they're still fighting and they're still persevering. Uh, and they, have, they are still strong in their Iman. But those who are, are, are having a luxurious life, yes, but they are following the, the Quran and the Sunnah, doesn't mean that they can't have a BMW or, or, or a, a nice house. It's about not having extravagance, but at the same time, fulfilling your commandments of Allah. You know, being rich and being wealthy is nothing wrong. It's how you've earned that wealth and how you spend that wealth. The more you earn, perhaps the more zakat you'll give. The more sadaqah and more lillah you give. The more give, the more you give, the more blessings you get. You know, I, it's like pruning, pruning your plants. The more you prune, the, the more growth you'll get. So I hope that answers your question, my brother. Uh, yes, Peter? Yeah, uh, just to add on to the point, um, one, uh, one uh, Syrian um, teacher said that, it's, it just goes to show how much they suffer. They, he said, we don't pray uh, five times a day, we pray six. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all that. 
At least that, they pray five times a day. The sixth salah is the Zaran salah because people are dying. That really shocked me when they said that. You, you know, there'll be a time that will so. come that there'll be so much bloodshed. This is the nearing time of the coming. Yeah. Earthquakes will be happening. The volcanoes will be, you know, exploded. Um, tornadoes, um, floods. These things are happening around the world. You know, we're talking about global warming, but global warming. But we, we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to look at the environment. It, it's very much mentioned in the Quran and Hadith, of course. At the same time, we have to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to be moderate in everything that we do. We have to be stingy in what we consume as well. And we have to be, as in, in aspects of what we use, is wholesome. For example, the food that we consume is wholesome food. And this is the reason why we should not become bankrupt when we come to on the Day of Judgment when we face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our beloved Prophet was asked, does that mean a person who is bankrupt who has got a financial problem? And the Prophet said, no. A bankrupt in my ummah is he who comes on the Day of Judgment with Salah, fasting and zakat, but he also comes having the dis uh, blasphemed this person, slandered and vilified this person, uh, has taken the wealth of this other person, spilling the blood of this person, hitting this one, and so on and so on. Just imagine. He'll have mountains of deeds, but he's wrong all these people. And what will happen on the Day of Judgment is that they start to start pass on the reward, their rewards onto them. And if all the rewards are exhausted, then their, their, their sins will be coming onto them. So this is what, what a bankrupt person is. So on the Day of Judgment, we don't want to come as a bankrupt person uh, in the eyes of Allah. I heard that uh, uh, Jannah is full of poor people and the hellfire is full of tyrants and king is kings and uh, you know uh, rulers and this uh, the sort the powerful people. Um, can you explain this please a little bit? You know, the, the, the first people who embrace Islam mm -hmm. when the Prophet started the mission when he, uh, after his prophethood were the poor people. You know, uh, so poor uh, uh, and they were only a small in number and they were so so much persecuted, but they still persevered. They still believed in Allah. They still followed the teachings of Islam. In fact, so much so that they were ridiculed and, and tortured and, and, and uh, you know, um, lots of bad things happening that our beloved Prophet had to send them to Abyssinia, to King Nigas, a Christian uh, king, so for protection. Mm -hmm. Just imagine, not a Muslim, and he protected them. Is it, is it true that uh, he, he revert, uh, the king reverted to Islam? Yeah, there is some stories that says that uh, he reverted to Islam. But is that uh, authentic now? We, we don't allow them. Yeah. But uh, what we know is that uh, we, these people did to go to King Nikas, and when two people of the Quraysh came, they didn't make, they take us back, and they decided to money him, yeah. and said no, uh, he said no, I want to keep them. Yeah, also I want to protect them. Also well, if we look at the Ethiopia is majority Muslim, yeah. Alhamdulillah, and then they used to be called Abyssinia. So Alhamdulillah, so if we look at the result of the population demographics in that place, in that area of life, they're mostly Muslim now, so Alhamdulillah, maybe. Yeah. 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 Also he said um, that the king himself said that uh, whatever these people are saying is true because Jesus obviously taught us that there's one God and everything. We just take him as a son of God, or, you know. That's why in this country we have to ensure that we respect and value everyone, whichever faith you belong to. No, you know, on the day of judgment or before they die, they might become Muslim. They may, may become better than us. So we, pe we consider people as human beings, Allah's creations. We respect them, we value them, we live side by side with them, we peacefully coexist with them. But the Jews and Christians, they are known as the Ahl Kitab. So they have the honorary title of the people of the book. We need to respect them even more. Because we're not Muslims if we don't believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. So we believe in all the prophets. Jesus, Moses, Noah, Jacob, Isaac, Noah, peace be upon them all. You know, there are 25 prophets mentioned in the Quran, and there were 124,000 that were sent from Adam alayhi salatu till uh, till our beloved Prophet. And our beloved Prophet explained to the companions, he said, you know, all this, all the messages is the same, to believe in the manas of Allah. And he said, Use it, consider this as a wall, and these are the bricks. And this missing brick is myself, bringing the same message, culmination of the same words, but this missing brick is myself, and I'm uh, the last of these bricks. I'm the last of the messenger, I'm the last of the spirit. You know, I'm, I'm usually thinking positively when I wake up in the morning, but then when I put the news on, <coughs> then you know, after a few minutes, we're not thinking so positively. Now, what do you think is uh, the link between materialism and thinking negatively, and uh, selflessness and thinking positively? So, say that again. 
So, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we watch the news and we see that the general world is a materialistic world because it's uh, a secular world, a, a world which doesn't have a link directly to God in regards to the mainstream. Um, when the world was uh, more connected to God in, uh, through governance, we found the people were more selfless, more mindful of each other, more caring to each other. And as we have drifted away from that norm, we have found that the world has become more of a negative thinking place, a place where people are you know, st more troubled in the mind. Um, That's true. So, but, but, but we as Muslims, we as believers, more materialistic, we don't look at the world that's around us. We change ourselves in the in the in the, in, the, in, the, in spite of the world and where it's going. We don't ch we don't want to change the world around us to fit us. And if you think like like that, you'll always be in a positive state of mind. You know, for example, uh, in the West we see uh, billboards that has got women as advertising, etc. But you've got the control of lowering your gaze. You don't want to change the world for you. You change yourself in the world. If you are thinking like that then you'll be content in life. You will be happy in life. So control your environment. Control the environment the way that you can, as, yeah, much, as, you can. as much as you can. Change the environment where you can, with your hand, <coughs> with the words, or with your, with your, in your heart. Yeah. Change it, be involved. Mm -hmm. Be involved with actions that are uh, to do with the environment, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, marching against the war in Iraq with your Christian friends. Do all the, all the good things that people do. Don't think, what is Islamic, what's not Islamic. Everything that's good is Islamic. The beautiful thing in our deen is that everything is allowed except for those things that are not allowed. So therefore, use technology, use advances in technology to do dawah, for example, to do goodness. Use it in that way. Consider it as a blessing from Allah SWT. Use these means and tools to and means to be able to do good for society. Welcome back, my brothers. Um, so, I'll carry on with this session about uh, how to be in a positive, uh, how to be in a positive state of mind, um, but also in respect of character and personality. What's the difference between character and personality? So, first of all, I just wanted to mention that uh, the important in Islam is to attain good character. The personality is the external aspect. When you see someone, you see their skin color, you see their language, their appearance their gender, etc, etc. But you don't see the character. That you can only know when you got to know them really well. And Hazrat Umar mentioned that um, you know, to really get to know to a, a person's character is whether you've traveled with them, whether you've been your neighbor, whether you've had your business transaction, etc, etc. Whether you've spent the whole day with them, etc. So, but as far as Islam is concerned, Islam does not ask you to change who you are but to transform what's bitter in you to something good. Not to change who you are, but to change what's bitter in yourself for good. And that's something, that's a very good advice. <clears throat> and therefore, you know, the way that we do things, the way that who we hang out with, in terms of peer pressure, for example, you have to choose who your friends are. Positive people gain happiness from the people they are with, and not just from within. Positive people gain happiness from whom they are with. And if there are people who are negative in your life, who, who are toxic people, dump them. Dump them, I tell you. Um, you can't dump your spouse. You can't dump your mum and dad. You can't dump your sister. They're your close relatives. So you work around with them. You change yourself to win their hearts and minds if you think that they are bad people. But again, it might be, this might be your perception. But you know, it's something you can change a child by your own actions. And what's important in Islam and in our deen is make sure the words you speak to them is so, uh, so relevant and so sensitive that you conceptualize your words before you speak, particularly to a child. And when you're speaking, whilst you're speaking, use the tonality in, the appropriate in an appropriate way and your body language. If you smile and you're speaking as well, and we, you've got a, a, a good persona, and you have you use correct tonality with the words, it has the greatest impact. According to Albert Maharabian, who's a psychologist, he said, whenever you speak something, only 7% of the words count. 38% is tonality, the tone that you use, and 55% is body language. Now you just imagine, 
if you say to a child, you know, have your dinner, but if you say it harshly, have you had your dinner yet? Just, have you had your dinner yet? The tonality is, makes a big difference to a child, to even a baby. They understand your language. So, and then if you, with a smile, you know, um, you know uh, can you have your food better? With the appropriate words, but with the correct tonality and correct body language, it, it w works wonders. So sometimes with your relatives whom you can't dump, you have to win their hearts and minds. You know, sometimes ch children will come to you, running to you, if you always be careful that you never lie to them, because they understand, they have memories, that you use the appropriate tonality, you careful with your words. I tell you, it, 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 it will change their lives, but their perception about you, and it, that, that will create happiness and contentment with yourself. So try to be with positive people, choose who your friends are. If you really want to test a person as to what they will become, look who they are hanging around with. I, I, but never be judgmental. I'll tell you a personal story. SubhanAllah. When I was at college, my parents always taught me not to be judgmental. Be good, but don't hate people. And um, at that time, there was not many Muslims. And those few Muslims that were there, we were always hanging around ourselves, you know, in the corner. But this one year, young man, he was among the non-Muslims, and he he was openly kissing the girl. He had a girlfriend, and we uh, were not uh, um, among the non-Muslims at that time. You know, there was this division, unfortunately. And um, some of my uh, people who were hanging around with, they were saying very bad things about him. You know, Astaghfirullah, he's going to go to hellfire. And I, heard, I know what my parents told me: don't judge people. And I didn't say anything, you know, 30 years on, or even 40 years on. You know what happened? He became so pious. He, be, he had a beard. Uh, he, was, he was praying five times a day. And the people who were ridiculing him were there, you know, in drugs and all sorts of vices. So never judge anyone, you know. So, so important about how you react to people that you be non-judgmental. You don't be, you don't have opinions of other people. You know, we, sometimes we're so self-opinionated, unfortunately. So if we have a clear mind about people, you feel happy and content yourself. And if you ha feel happy, look around who you are, who are you with, but also what you do and what you watch. You know, if you are stressed so easily, don't watch the news because it's always negative. Let Allah SWT control the world. We've got no power. What you can control is your own heart, the, way, the things that you see, the things that you think. You've got total control over that and how you think about things and how you perceive things. That's up to you. So dump those people who are giving negativity. It's like that example I gave earlier, the perfume seller and the blacksmith example. You know? um, so in a, in a perfume shop, if you go there, you might not apply the perfume so the fragrance will be rubbing off on you. Similarly, if you're with good people, it will rub off on you. And if you go to a blacksmith, you might not use the equipment, but the black smoke and the black suit will be coming onto you. So if you're with evil people, it will rub off on you. Stay away from them. Honestly, it's, uh, better. it's so important that you, find, you select your friends. But then after all, subhanAllah, you've only got two friends in life. Who are they? Can you tell me, tell me who, who, are, who are the two Thanks. friends that you have in life? Parents is two good parents. They are and be a, you know be good friends with them. Who else? You only have two friends in life. Who are they? One is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Of course. And the second one, who the one who reminds you of Allah. Two friends. One is Allah. And the second one is the one who reminds you of Allah. All those who are reminded, including parents, all those who remind you of Allah. If they don't, dump them. Or you be the leader, you change them. And that's why we have to focus on our character. Because personality is easy to see. But we perceive people as extrovert, for example, or sensitive, optimistic, confident, ambitious, or quiet, or lazy, etc., etc., negative, or shy. That's the personality. 
That's the external part. Whereas the character includes traits such as honesty, kindness, loyalty. That's, easy, 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 that's not easy to suss out, isn't it? Unless you're in a very difficult situation, unless you're traveling, for example. So while some people will have well-developed personalities that everyone loves, their character is completely different and so distasteful that eventually people avoid them because deep down you know these external traits uh, uh, have no value. So, you know, this is the reason why sometimes you might have seen it in your own life. You might want to give an example to myself. Have you not seen sometimes that um, simple, some people will praise you and you might think, what have I done? You know what's happened? When, when you do good and Allah is pleased you, Allah SWT announces to Jibreel, I am pleased with my banda, I am pleased with this slave of mine, so you be pleased with him as well. So what Jibreel does, he announces it in, into the heavens that Allah is pleased with this person. So all the angels praise, uh, announce it that this per Allah is pleased with this person. And that's, this permeates to human beings on the earth. And that's why you might think, you know, this is from Allah. You know, when somebody praises you, you know, it's not... My name is Muhammad, and we're here at the Peace Center today. Um, I've learned many things, and uh, there was a bayan just now, and it, they were talking about character mainly, and how you should perfect your character, the laziness, like how to avoid being lazy, and the exercises and the things you need to do to actually get up, and so sometimes you have trouble in, uh, getting up a budget as well. So it's, it's a very key thing to actually battle and attack that issue, which most of us have trouble in. We all chase our desires, sleep is a desire, believe it or not. But yeah, I've learned a lot from this Bayan and it's so beneficial. And I do uh, recommend that everyone listens to the Bayan. Jazakallah. Assalamu my name is Hussain from the Peace Center. We are in talk with the brother and it was very beneficial. We learned a lot. We he had um, loads of different topics on the board. He taught us a lot about not just Islam, but how to live our lives in general. It helped me in many ways. We spoke about, we touched upon how to be less lazy. He gave us a lot of tips and advice regarding how to plan your day, how to properly do your time management, work out what you have to do in the day, and expand on how other people would be and be very conscious of how other people would feel if you're late for something or doing something wrong. Hello, My name is Abdurrahman and uh, we are at this New Year's Eve event for the youth and uh, it's 3 a.m. right now. It's very early in the morning and uh, there's three things that I found very interesting was uh, the beginning where the youth got together, the uh, brothers got together and uh, we spoke about each other's backgrounds and uh, each other's uh, uh, community and everything and uh, Alhamdulillah got to know and uh, the second part I found interesting was when the brother was giving a presentation and he got interacting with the audience and uh, he was asking them questions and it, w it was interesting and uh, obviously the third part and the last part is the games and obviously the games that were uh, held by the brothers, I really appreciate it from the whole community. So I